at all. 
They took thirty pieces of silver, the value of man with a price on his head, a price set by the Israelites, and they paid it out for the potter's field just as the Lord had commanded me. Jesus was arraigned before the procurator who questioned him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus responded, As you say, yet when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he had made no reply. Then Pilate said to him, Surely you hear how many charges they bring against you. He did not answer Pilate in a single account, much to the procurator's surprise. Now on the occasion of a festival, the procurator was accustomed to release one prisoner, whom the crowd would designate. They had at the time a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, since they were already assembled, Pilate said to them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or, or Jesus, the so-called Messiah? Pilate knew, of course, that it was out of jealousy that they had handed Jesus over. While Pilate was still presiding on the bench, his wife sent him a message, Do not interfere in the case of that holy man. I had a dream about him today, which has greatly upset me. Meanwhile, the chief priests and elders convinced the crowds that they should ask for Barabbas and have Jesus put to death. So when the procurator asked them, Which one do you wish me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what am I to do with Jesus, the so-called Messiah? Crucified him, they all cried. He said, Why, what crime has he committed? But they only shouted the louder, Crucify him. Pilate finally realized that he was making no oppression, and that a riot was breaking out instead. He called for water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, declaring as he did so, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. The responsibility is yours. The whole people said in reply, Let his blood be upon us and our children. After that, Pilate, Pilate released Barabbas to them. Jesus, however, he first had scourged, then he handed him over to be crucified. The procurator's soldiers took Jesus inside the praetorium and collected the whole cohort around him. They stripped off his clothes and wrapped him in a scarlet military coat. Weaving a crown out of thorns, they fixed it on his head and stuck a reed in his right hand. Then they began to mock him by dropping to their knees before him, saying, All hail, King of the Jews. They also spat at him. Afterward, they took hold of the reed and kept striking him on the head. Finally, when they had finished making a fool of him, they stripped him of the cloak dressed him in his own clothes, and led him off to crucifixion. On their way out, they met a, met a Cyrenian named Simon. This man they pressed into service to carry the cross. Upon arriving at a site called Golgotha, a name which means a skull place, the soldiers gave Jesus a drink of wine flavored with gall, which Jesus tasted but refused to drink. When they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him. Above his head they had put the charge against him in writing, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two insurgents were crucified along with him, one at his right and one at his left. One of the criminals hanging in crucifixion blasphemed Jesus, Aren't you the Messiah? Then save yourself and save us. But the other one rebuked the first, Have you no fear of God, seeing you are under the same sentence? We deserve it after all, we are only paying the price for what we've done, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, to, then he said Jesus, remember me when you enter upon your reign. And Jesus replied, I assure you, this day you will be with me in paradise. People kept going by, insulting Jesus, tossing their heads, saying, So you are the one who was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Save yourself, why don't you come down off that cross if you are God's son? The chief priests, the scribes, 
and the elders also joined in the cheering. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. So he is the King of Israel. Let him, let's see him come down from the cross, and then we will believe in him. He relied on God. Let God rescue him now, if he wants to. After all, he claimed, I am God's son. The insurgents who had been crucified with him kept haunting him in the same way. From noon onward, there was darkness over all the whole land until mid-afternoon. Then toward mid-afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud tone, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This made some of the bystanders who heard it remark, he is invoking Elijah. Immediately one of them ran off and got a sponge. He soaked it in cheap wine and sticking it on a reed, tried to make Jesus drink. Meanwhile, the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see whether Elijah comes to his rescue. Once again, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, then gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, boulders split, tombs opened. Many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they came forth from their tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. The centurion and his men who were keeping watch over Jesus were terror-stricken at seeing the earthquake and all that was happening and said, clearly this was the Son of God. Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want to have the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a solemn feast day. They asked Pilate that the legs be broken and the bodies be taken away. Accordingly, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the men crucified with Jesus, first of the one and of the other. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. One of the soldiers thrust a lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. This testimony has been given by an eyewitness, and his testimony is true. He tells what he knows is true, so that you may believe. These events took place for the fulfillment of the scripture. Break none of his bones. There is still another scripture passage which says, They shall look on him whom they have pierced. Many women were present, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to attend to his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When evening fell, a wealthy man from Arimathea followed, arrived, Joseph by name. He was another of Jesus' disciples and had gone to request the body of Jesus. Thereupon Pilate issued an order for its release. Taking the body, Joseph wrapped it in fresh linen and placed it in his own new tomb, which had been hewn from a formation of rock. Then he rolled a new stone across the entrance of the tomb and went away. But Mary Magdalene and the other Mary remained sitting there, facing the tomb. Glory be to your long suffering, O
Savior of all, when you blessed yourself for all men. 
So Joseph of Arimathea took that body off the cross, placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. This is rock. This is a tomb. I'm so happy that at St. Joseph Church we have this authentic tomb, something that's real, something that's rock. It's heavy. It took our strongest parishioners to put this up. Can't buy it. Some of the parishioners crafted it. But it's authentic. It's real. And this is authentic. And it's real. Christ's body, lifeless, placed in a tomb. And who would have thunk it? The week started out quite nice. He entered Jerusalem as a king. But matters swiftly spiraled downhill. He was betrayed. He was arrested. He was convicted and sentenced to crucifixion. And all the things then associated with his passion, suffering, an eventual death. There's sadness. He did this out of his love for us. He knew his fate. He knew that he was going to end up in this tomb. An authentic, real, genuine death after so much suffering. And we have the audacity to call it Good Friday. Ah, but God does some of his best work in tombs. In tombs, he resurrects the things that are dead. Some of his best work in tombs. Speaking of tombs, it seems as though we've kind of been in our tombs since this coronavirus, our homes, in ways we've maybe never experienced before with one another. Those who are fortunate to still work, they get out of the homes, people can go shop, free groceries, so we do get out. But by and large, people are in their tombs, so to speak, during these unusual times. But God does some of his greatest work in the tombs. So for example, our faith life has been drastically changed. And we're missing the Eucharist. We're missing being with one another. But some interesting statistics have emerged from this. For example, with our YouTube liturgies, they're nearing a thousand views. About a thousand views. We get about 300 people on a weekend at St. Joseph. About a thousand views, averaging maybe two people per household. That's 2,000 people who are viewing the liturgy, who are hungry and want to connect with God. During Lent this year, I was giving Wednesday 
adult education classes after the pre-sanctified liturgy, and we had maybe 15, 20 people. I was happy with that. Once we started putting them on YouTube, the numbers now are closer to 200 people. Folks clamoring to have some contact, to increase their faith, to have some knowledge during this time of absence. I'm hoping, of course, that when we go back to normal, whatever that is, that there will be a reflection of increased faith. I'd like, once we are able to have our first liturgy, to have a packed church. I don't think that's going to happen because this is going to be gradual. There's still going to be some people with some fears. Still be some people who are cautious. So I don't think that first liturgy is going to be filled to the gills. But I'm hoping eventually this will happen. Because God does some of His greatest work in the tombs. How about spouses? In many instances, Spouses are having to spend more time with themselves than who knows when. What can become of that? Hopefully more positives. Hopefully opportunities for good to happen. To rekindle their romance. To learn and enjoy one another. Because God does some of His greatest work in the tombs. And extending that just a little bit, families with children still at home, once again, the closeness that maybe doesn't exist, certainly not at its fullest, has been forced. Kids are home. They have to do online classes and Mothers or fathers who aren't accustomed to homeschooling have to jump in there. I've heard of families enjoying games together, families praying together, turning on the Divine Liturgy and participating as they view it on their computers or television screens. Because God does some of His greatest works in the tombs. Even with friends, People are reaching out, contacting, connecting, calling people that they haven't talked to in a while. I've experienced that. Because God does some of His greatest work in the tombs. How interesting that He slowed us down in a world that sometimes races at breakneck speed to be able to tend to those things that really matter. Faith, family, friends. Because God does some of His greatest work in the tombs. With this coronavirus, it was supposed to be a really, really bad week. Whether or not the numbers have added up to that, I'm not sure. But it was also a really bad week for Jesus. He ended up in the tomb. But look at the results. Because God does his greatest works in the tombs. We as Christians, as believers, have to come to know and realize that it's our belief in Him 
in the resurrection Lord. He remains our only true hope. Christ is good and loves us all. Amen. 